very much. Thank you very much for your interest, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is joint work with uh, postdoc Burak Chakmak, and uh, as you see here, it's about analyzing an algorithm, but it's not analyzing deep learning. Well, maybe in the future, I don't know, but it's something much simpler. It's related to probabilistic approximate inference. So just to remind you uh, the background sort of in data science, you uh, have a probabilistic model. Y are observed quantities. X are things that you don't know, but you have a prior distribution on them. And you compute posteriors. And the usual problem is to marginalize out the unobserved quantities, which give you some kind of partition function or the likelihood of the data. Or you integrate out all the variables, let's say, except for variable i. And you get the marginal distribution of variable i. And the problems, um, usually, if the model is not Gaussian or, or completely factorizing, then you can't do them exactly. And people have come up with lots of methods for computing those things approximately. So that's essentially the background. But um, yeah, and the problem that I'm going to, to tackle is uh, um, analyze a toy model for approximate inference. And essentially, it goes back to the TAP equation that have been mentioned a couple of times this morning, uh, also with Mark, and um, understand their typical dynamical properties of the algorithm and maybe, yeah, understand why, why it, what, what it does. So the outline would be, really I concentrate on the toy example, the simple Ising model, and uh, I will introduce um, as approximate inference uh, method, the so-called TAP method or TAP equations. And in order to make the data a little bit more structured, not being completely random, I work with a model um, of uh, coupling matrices that are sort of, that come from a random orthogonal ensemble. Then I will define an algorithm for solving these TAP equations and analyze them by a tool that has been used for many years in uh, also in, this, in the spin glass physics, it's a method of dynamical functionals. And it turns out we can get a nice analytical solution. And I think we also can get an understanding why the algor algorithm works uh, well, converges nicely. And uh, as I said, the toy example is not really an, um, um, an example with or for real data. But it, we hope that it makes sense to look at the simplest case, at least. And, uh, Yes, yeah, so related work, actually my motivation um, uh, comes from a talk that was a long, long time ago, possibly in 2002, given by Yoshioki um, Kabashima on uh, approximate message passing algorithms. So you come up with a uh, belief propagation algorithm, you approach um, the dense limit, and then you can sort of analyze the dynamics of this uh, belief propagation. And uh, um, more recently, I got introduced into uh, um, um, uh, an algorithm introduced by, by Bolthausen for solving the TAP equations for the SK model, for the Schrenk Kirkpatrick model. Then later, there was rigorous work on, on so called uh, approximating um, message passing algorithms uh, for random IID matrices and generalization to more, uh, to more correlated matrices by, by Rangan and so on. And all these, uh, all these things show a result that there is some kind of a density evolution that tells you we have time-dependent order parameters, and they usually fulfill a one-step update of these, uh, of these order parameters. And so I think my question already in 2003 was, how on earth can that be? Because there is some random matrix. We do some nonlinear operations. We define a dynamics uh, of a variable involving some kind of random matrix. And we all know there must be some, a uh, lot of metastable states. There must be glassiness or things like that. And it must be horrible. But it seems like, you know, things seem to converge nicely. And what makes it? What makes it converge? What, what makes it simple? That's, that was one of the questions that I tried to understand. So back to the simplest model, the Ising model with couplings Jij, binary spins plus minus 1, external field Hi. I even set the Hi equal to a constant H. 
uh, which makes me, uh, yeah, I can look up results from the replicas in, in, uh, in the paper so I don't can really compare uh, um, um, to, to, to the simplest case. So there's no, really no real data here. There is a coupling matrix Jij. And the inference problem that we try to solve essentially is computing the magnetization of each spin, at least approximately for a large system. And that brings us back to the TAP equations named after Thaulis, Anderson, and Palmer. Um, that gives you a set of nonlinear self-consistent equations for the magnetization, uh, and this is valid. Actually, you get the exact result in the limit n to infinity for a Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. Um, that means we have random couplings, and the coupling strength scales like 1 over square root of n in the paramagnetic phase. So this is these kind of things I would now call inference computing uh, of the computation of marginal statistics of the moments um, uh, of this Ising model. So it's a question. So this, this, is what, this is our goal. We want to have an algorithm that converges to uh, the solution of this kind of fixed point equation. And uh, people telling me, if you just do a simple iteration, putting uh, time t on the right-hand side and time t plus 1 on the left-hand side isn't really a good thing, so it will never converge. And there are more interesting ways for doing it. And um, so in order to make to go beyond that simple um, random matrix Jij, where you completely have independent random couplings making it a little bit more interesting, trying to cover correlated couplings Jij, I will introduce um, a, uh, um, a structured, a more structured ensemble of random matrices, and this is known as the rotationally invariant uh, ensemble. So that means I write this uh, J matrix as an orthogonal matrix O times a diagonal um, O transpose, a diagonal matrix O, and assume that O is a random orthogonal matrix, so it means it's a, it's a random rotation, a Haar matrix. So this is the kind of ensemble that I'm studying, and we assume that uh, this matrix lambda, uh, um, so the diagonals, um, the, the elements of the diagonal will converge to, uh, um, the density of eigenvalues will converge to something, to some nice density uh, uh, for the limit uh, n to infinity. So in this case, the Js can be really dependent random variables. And um, of course, this doesn't work for sparse matrices, so, so we're usually in the field of uh, dense matrices. So this is kind of model now, random matrices that are uh, generated in such a way. And the uh, completely independent couplings in the, J in, in the Schrank and Kirkpatrick models are also a specific case of that. So, a specific example of that was actually introduced this morning in the second uh, part of uh, Mark, Mark's talk. So you can actually generate such an ensemble um, by using such uh, outer product structure in the coupling matrix and assuming that this variable x is like, uh, has a layered structure. So you multiply different x's, um, uh, random matrices x, uh, with each others, and you assume that these x's are iid, um, have iid entries. And I think the major difference between what uh, Mark explained this morning and this talk, I explicitly assume that the, all these x's are essentially Gaussian and not binary. But at the end of the day, if you analyze uh, the corresponding TAP equations, you get the same. So it doesn't care uh, um, about uh, the discreteness or or continuous. So this is an example of that rotationally invariant matrix ensemble. And um, yeah, so what are the TAP equations for this case? And they have been uh, studied for quite a long time. In 95, the result was given by uh, Parisi and, and Potters. And they showed essentially the magnetization is the hyperbolic tangent of this field gamma i. The field gamma i is the simple mean field, the naive mean field term, plus an Onsager reaction term. So that means uh, there's a reaction of all the other spins 
uh, by the interaction with spin i. And this constant in front of it, that's the only point where the specific ensemble comes in. So this Rj is known as the R transform of that random matrix ensemble. So it's the only, it's just a number that tells you uh, what, what is the specific ensemble uh, that, that enters here. And um, so just to briefly explain what is this R transform, so we all know this green function of the matrix J, so essentially this depends only on the spectrum of uh, these random matrix ensemble, and uh, essentially it's related to the functional inverse of the green function <coughs> minus something subtracted. So it's just all, you can get it from the spectrum by computing the green function and do an inversion. Okay, so that's essentially it. Uh, so it's just one number that you have to compute um, uh, in order to define these, uh, uh, one extra number that makes uh, one matrix uh, ensemble different from the other. Okay, so this is uh, an old result from 1995. And um, so here's our algorithm. Of course, this algorithm didn't fall from the sky. It was it's a little bit related to a so-called VAMP uh, vectorial uh, uh, approximate message passing algorithm. Um, and, um, but since that was not originally applied to uh, TAP equations, so we modified it a little bit. And um, yeah, it looks like that. Um, sorry, it looks like this. Um, so, so this internal, this, uh, there's, um, when you come back to the TAP equations, wait a minute. Uh, so you see there's this field gamma i. Once you have this gamma i, you can easily compute the m i. So we have a dynamics that uh, computes these gamma i. So what's the dynamic dynamics? Um, so we start from a random configuration. It's a bit technical here. U i are Gaussian, so it's a Gaussian in initialization. And here's the essential iteration. So we pass this gamma, so gamma is computed. Um, um, multiplying a specific matrix with gamma tilde, passing it through some nonlinearity, and get a new value. So it's a typical, this looks a little bit like a recurrent neural network. So you have uh, some coupling matrix A, and you multiply some vectors by, um, with this A, then you pass it pointwise through a nonlinearity, and the nonlinearity is essentially this tang minus gamma I, and uh, this A um, has a somewhat strange kind of definition. I'll come back to it, why it should be that. And then we say, okay, um, there's a few things that have to be pre-computed before you run the algorithm and you can actually do it on a concrete matrix. You need these R transforms, but you can do, you can do an approximation on a, on a concrete matrix. And that's essentially the algorithm that should do good things. So why this and what, uh, what uh, could we expect? Well, first of all, we want to analyze it using tools of statistical mechanics in the limit n to infinity. And remember what we have uh, in this, uh, in this uh, definition of the algorithm. Here's the coupling matrix J. The coupling matrix J defines this matrix A. And if J is rotationally invariant, then A is also rotationally invariant. So it's a, it's, um, it's um, in order to analyze this kind of thing, we use a technique that has been used um, for many years in, in, in a spin glass world. So it's a so-called generating functional technique introduced by Martin, Sija, and Rose. Then I think the next ones were uh, Sampolinsk and Sepelius for the SK model, and there was uh, related work by John Hertz, uh, Hayo Sommers, Heinz Horner, Crisanti, and many others. It was quite something that people did in, 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 in the 80s and in early 90s. And so the idea is essentially, we have a dynamical system, so that defines a trajectory of length t over uh, these dynamical variables. They are coupled by a random matrix A. And in order to compute properties in the limit n to infinity, you uh, define um, a kind of uh, partition function where you sort of integrate over all these uh, variables, and you put the dynamics into delta functions. And from computing such a, a generating functional, you can then compute 
the properties uh, by doing the average over uh, this uh, random coupling. The nice thing is, since this partition function is normalized to ones, you don't even need replicas. And this all works nicely um, when you take uh, um, sort of uh, a finite length trajectory and take then n to the limit n to infinity. So the technicalities are sort of you replace a delta function by Fourier trans, uh, by its Fourier uh, representation, then you have to do certain expectations over expressions like that, and with a bit of random matrix theory, you can do that exactly. And at the end of the day, you get, uh, you, um, uh, you get a uh, resulting non-random uh, model where um, the couplings between the variables, i and j, are now replaced by couplings of a single variable over time. So you can actually calculate asymptotically what is the marginal distribution over uh, single variable trajectories. And that's the idea. And at the end of the day, what you get um, with a bit of work is something like that. If you look at a single variable, I don't write um, gamma i anymore, I just write gamma or gamma tilde. So you're sitting at a specific site and you say, okay, here is gamma tilde. Here's a nonlinear function defined by gamma and gamma actually interacts with the past of gamma tilde. So this is a memory kernel and there is a Gaussian noise acting on it. So the, um, the couplings, the interactions with the neighboring spins is replaced by a self-interaction that goes over time, which is understandable. So when I'm here and I'm interacting with my neighbor, then the neighbor will also, in the next steps, will interact with me again. So there will be an influence of myself uh, um, on, 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 on my future, uh, on, uh, on the future of my field. And of course, um, that comes by the symmetry of the coupling matrix, uh, you would expect such uh, a thing to appear. And essentially, forget about all the, tech, um, uh, the technicalities, this g hat, this, um, this memory term is derived from a linear response kind of thing, because essentially what uh, in, in, in the large n limit, the interactions are so weak that my influence on the neighbor can somehow be treated by linear response, and that's how you get this linear response uh, relation in. Well, so you get this thing. This thing is related uh, to uh, an R transform uh, in, in a matrix space, uh, really ugly stuff. And also, the Gaussian process that drives the whole system has a horribly complicated correlation function, and that should be the end of it, right? I mean, this is exact, possibly not rigorous, but we could work on it, make it rigorous, but it doesn't help you. I mean, just then simulate the whole system. It's, it's, it's as complicated as, as, as this analytical theory. So because, well, we could stop here because there are only very, very few models that you could solve exactly. Analytically, of course, if the nonlinear function wouldn't be nonlinear, but just linear, you could do it. If the random matrix would not be symmetric, but you know, AIJ and AJI would be uncorrelated, then of course the, um, the memory terms vanish because my, the, the interaction this in this direction is independent of, uh, of the reaction to the other side. So these things simplified as no memory and you can solve things that has been done uh, for certain neural network models by Crisanti, Sampolinsky, and others. The other thing that is solvable is a spherical p-spin model, uh, and you get, in this case, closed form integral equations for all these correlation and response functions. But this is not the case. We have just p equals 2, and uh, it's uh, spherical. In our case, it's not even spherical. So what can we do? We'll just simply go through the calculation and, uh, well, here's an, here's an example how these things look like if you try to solve these, these, these uh, equations with memory using a Monte Carlo method, and we did that many, many years ago, and this is a response function. So how does uh, a spin at time 100 uh, react to uh, a little perturbation uh, at um, times before? And you see, oh my goodness, there's even 
uh, a response to the earliest time, and that will lead to a remnant magnetization. Ugly things, and this algorithm will not converge to anything nice. This is for an SK model, for the zero temperature relaxation of an SK model. So, well, okay. So, having said that, um, things are actually uh, nicer for this very specific function f, and what we get is, surprise, surprise, the memory itself vanishes completely. There's no memory terms, and what we get is a very simple dynamics. This variable gamma tilde is driven by gamma pointwise, and gamma itself is a Gaussian, and a Gaussian, well, we can compute its, its covariance, and so things are much, much simpler. Some Gaussian fed into a nonlinear function completely derives the uh, dynamics of a single variable. And does it work? So there's a comparison uh, between um, a simulated system where you, where you calculate the covariance at two time steps uh, from a simulation, and this one is the one that comes uh, solving these uh, nonlinear uh, equations um, of this uh, forward. And so this is a comparison between the two squared taking the 10 logs. So it's really small uh, for, for a model of uh, a two-layer hop field uh, model with 10 to the 4 spin. So, well, it seems to work. And um, uh, actually, this is a, a comparison of a single simulation of the system with this, just no averaging a single trajectory uh, compared uh, with a the theory. And, um, the nice thing, you can also calculate exactly uh, what's the asymptotics of the algorithm. You can show that uh, about the convergence rate of this field gamma towards its uh, converged value is given by this quantity. And interesting enough, you see this quantity should be, in order to get convergence, uh, of course, this quantity should be uh, less than 1. And uh, this condition equal one, that is precisely the, uh, the almeida Thaulis line. And uh, of, if you're on the other side, then you get divergence. And, and, and so this, this is not longer valid. And if you just compare it uh, with simulations, it seems to do a fairly decent job. So this is the asymptotics computed from the simulations, the red lines. And these are... Uh, the, the simulations on a single trajectory, and actually this 0.35 is very close to the critical uh, point, the AT point uh, that we have. So it's getting slower and slower in converging. So, well, you see this works, and I just, I don't know, it's magic, why does it work? And uh, so in order to get an understanding why this may work, um, I just try to introduce one little thing that I learned about um, random matrix theory. It's uh, the notion of asymptotic uh, freeness. And so um, these um, mathematicians introduce the normalized trays in the limit n to infinity. So you take the trays of an n by n matrix, normalize it 1 over n, take the limit n to infinity, and you define freeness between asymptotic freeness between a and b. So if you take a bunch of polynomials, P1, Q1, P2, Q2, and you always have one B between two A's and uh, um, one A between two B's, and so this normalized trace is zero if the, uh, the individual traces are also zero in the limit. So it has a kind of a flavor of statistical independence. So if you would think that, um, these uh, variables A and B were not just matrices, but just ordinary random variables, X and Y. And if you replace the, this operator phi by an expectation, and you would say, oh, A and B are independent if, uh, of course, uh, the function um, of this, uh, this expectation of that function would be zero, if these individual terms would have zero mean, then, of course, that's the notion of independence. But here we have, uh, instead of expectation, we have this normalized trace. And uh, we define a similar um, um, operation. It has a smell of independence, but it's not uh, um, statistical independence, but it's called freeness here. Um, um, and especially since these matrices do not commute, A and B, usually we will have 
uh, we will have uh, this specific order. So if we this have this condition, um, the vanishing of phi, if these individual things uh, have sort of zero mean, then we call them uh, free. And um, especially A and B are asymptotically free of the two eigenspaces are in generic position, um, for instance, obtained by a random rotation. So it fits very much into that framework of rate rotationally invariant uh, random matrix ensembles. And um, uh, one important thing, let's say we have uh, two, let's say, deterministic diagonal matrices, lambda and lambda prime, and we consider a, a random rotation, then uh, this uh, matrix A, which is generated by a random uh, rotation um, coming from the lambda prime matrix, then A and lambda are typically, in, are asymptotically free. So this is a, a result that you find in the literature. And now let me come back to analyzing this specific algorithm. And you will see what are the uh, ingredients that we need. So this is the dynamics of the original uh, algorithm. So again, multiplying a random matrix by some field, passing that field into a nonlinear, uh, in, in, into some uh, uh, nonlinear uh, function. And um, so I mentioned that the origin of these complications, the origin of having a memory into the past, which possibly will also be detrimental for the convergence of the algorithm, at least it will be very bad for analyzing it, comes from the fact that uh, if I interact with my neighbor, my neighbor interacts back uh, with me at a different time, and this interaction is somehow uh, um, related to the linear response. So how does gamma i change if I um, make a little perturbation at gamma j, a previous time step. So let's linearize the dynamics. And then we'll see that the linearized dynamics, essentially by the chain rule, uh, is composed of this matrix A and a diagonal matrix E at some previous time step. So you just differentiate that equations. You get an A, and you have to differentiate this hyperbolic tangent and so on. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the construction, you'll see by construction, the normalized, the, uh, the normalized trace of the matrix A is zero. And it turns out in the limit also the normalized trace of the diagonal matrix, the so sum of the diagonal matrix is constructed in such a way that they are both trace zero in the limit. And now if we uh, think about that A and E would be actually free, so this is a, this, this rotationally invariant um, um, sort of, uh, it's a member of the rotationally invariant ensemble, and E is a diagonal. Of course, there's a little snag here, so the theory is not, is not a proof. This is more like a heuristic. Since E also somehow depends on A, possibly in a very weak sense, and we, put, um, sort of we sweep that, uh, this interaction a little bit under the carpet and assume as possibly not um, uh, um, can be proved still that A and E are, um, uh, are free, then we'll see that um, we, can, um, we can simplify uh, traces of products of A and E. Now, if we really look at the dynamical response function, essentially we go through the chain rule and multiply matrices A and E. So always A and E, so you differentiate, take the chain rule, and so on. And at the end of the day, you uh, take the trace of it, normalize it, and then with these arguments that we had, on freeness of A and E, this would be zero. So essentially, we believe that the essential ingredient of that algorithm, why we can analyze it and why, why it is um, becoming so simple, is essentially the trace zero property of A and E and the assumed freeness of A and E. And then we get uh, essentially the memory term should uh, be zero. And um, as a second result, you can also look at the asymptotics, so how fast does the algorithm converge? And with a similar argument, you could say, if I kick it a little bit um, in a random direction away from the fixed point, and then look at the linearized dynamics, you see, again, you have to multiply a bunch of uh, A and E algorithms and so on, and then take, again, the trace. So you assume if the, initial, um, if the initial perturbation was somehow random at the end of the day, 
you're going to have a big trace here. And if you evaluate that again using uh, the assum assumption of freeness, what you get uh, is, is uh, essentially the normalized trace of a squared and e squared. And tau is sort of the number of time step that I have. And uh, this is precisely the, um, uh, the decay that we have computed from the dynamical functional theory. So using the simple assumption of freeness, we can argue why there should be no response terms uh, in the theory, and we can argue also the speed of convergence, and we find the AT line uh, uh, with this method. So that's essentially my, my main message. And um, so here's, a, again, a comparison of uh, the algorithm that we have. Uh, so this is the convergence. Um, this is what's predicted by, by this asymptotic that I showed. This is actually an older algorithm. It's the one that is, uh, was first given by, Boltzma, uh, by, <laughs> by Bolthausen uh, uh, for the decay of the error. Uh, um, this is the case of the sharing kirkpatrick model. And now, having said that, so it's possibly the freeness of, uh, of these matrices that play a role. Um, we try to check a little bit the robustness going away uh, from these random rotations that we have that we used explicitly in the dynamical functional approach and um, using an ensemble that has much, much less uh, randomness in it. And that is given by coupling matrices that are formed by so-called Hadamar matrices. And these Hadamar matrices are uh, just they are deterministically constructed. And there's a little bit of randomness here. So these diagonal elements, so we have this O tilde. They turn out to be, um, they turn out to be uh, orthogonal matrices, but they are not uh, sort of random orthogonal ones. But they are computed by Hadamard matrices multiplied by, uh, by um, plus minuses. Um, and uh, essentially, so these matrix elements of the orthogonal matrix is just a binary matrix. And so we can um, still uh, look at the literature um, uh, having, having freeness for, for, for two matrices from, from that ensemble. And um, so we would expect, if we go away from the uh, random matrix, from the completely random matrix case of random rotations to this Hadamar ensemble, which has much less explicit randomness in it, we should still get decent results um, between the theory that we have and, and uh, the simulations. So it's the same kind of plot. The predictions of the uh, correlation functions and the one that you get from a single uh, simulation of the algorithm, just plugging in these Hadamar uh, things computing the empirical R transform and so on, which just depends on the spectrum and not on anything else. And so it seems to work well, and also in the prediction of the asymptotic decay. So it seems like maybe there's something behind this, this freeness assumption, the idea that these uh, matrices that we, that we are using have sort of a, a random um, direction uh, um, um, relative to to this uh, to this um, uh, to this eigenspace of, of the diagonal matrix, which is just the simple uh, Euclidean ones. So um, of course it's possible. I mean, I just explained most of the stuff just for the for the simple Ising model, but you can extend that also to other algorithms uh, that that solve uh, problems. Um, uh, in probabilistic modeling uh, for a simple Bayesian classifier. And again, uh, you, would get, uh, you would get a decay of the error based on, on that formula that we got from, from, the, uh, uh, from this random matrix assumption. So that actually brings me uh, to uh, the end of my talk. And as I promise, nothing deep here, nothing deep, it's just uh, a simple solution of TAP equations for a sort of somehow correlated coupling matrices. So this is not the real world. And of course, um, yeah, one should look at, is this enough to treat real data? Maybe we have to think about uh, more um, interesting ensembles. And, but hopefully, we can carry some of these uh, things that we learned uh, over to the real case. 
Uh, but in the meantime, you can still look at uh, things that we can still do from the theory. We, could, we will try uh, to analyze sequential dynamics, which is uh, interesting for, for, for practical reasons, maybe uh, sequential dynamics in the sense of mini batches or something like that. And of course, there's something that I don't understand at the moment, with no understanding. This is not a gradient descent algorithm. I mean, you could have said, well, look, I mean, there is some sort of free energy, beta free energy, TAP free energy. There should be a gradient descent algorithm that looks completely different and possibly will not converge. And what's the relation between these type of algorithms that are sort of handcrafted uh, or just come from, uh, from uh, um, maybe motivated by belief propagation things? And what's the relation to gradient descent dynamics? Are there any energies, free energies that we could analyze and understand why these things go so smoothly uh, through, uh, through their dynamics. Uh, uh, the next step will be something, you know, this is just coupling matrices that I introduced coming from some ensemble, but in practice they might be learned by some learning algorithm. That's on, on top of it, there will be uh, uh, something uh, telling you uh, how do these JIJs change over time, and is there anything we could say about that? And finally, yes, of course, um, this is exact but not rigorous. Um, as a physicist, I wouldn't really care too much, but uh, sort of I'm working in a computer science department, and from time to time, um, if it's possible, maybe we can do some rigorous work uh, getting, getting these things uh, uh, really uh, mathematically clean, as clean as possible, and I would be really interested in that. Um, yeah, that's really the end of my talk. Thank you very much.